Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's program, Theatrical Engagement, Stand Lai in Conversation. My name is Wenxin Ye. I am a professor of history and director of the Institute of East Asian Studies here at UC Berkeley. I am pleased and honored to be your moderator in conversation with Dr. Lai. This program is jointly sponsored by the Institute of East Asian Studies, Arts Research Center, Townsend Center for the Humanities, and Center for Chinese Studies. Before we get the program started, I'd like to offer a brief introduction of Stan Lai. And then I would also like to take this as an opportunity to remind all of you to please turn off your cell phone. This program is being video recorded. Thank you. So um, Stan Lai was born in 1954 in Washington, DC. He's the son, he was the son of a diplomat. In 1966, he moved in to Taiwan. He finished college in Taiwan in 1976, got married in 1978, and then came to Berkeley in 1978 together alongside with his spouse. And the two of them, both of them, finished their PhD degree here at Berkeley. Stan received his PhD in 1983 in dramatic art. After that, he returned to Taiwan. He became the founding dean and professor of College of Theater at the Taipei National University of the Arts. In 1984, Stan and Dr. Ding, his wife, co-founded the Performance Workshop with Stan being the artistic director and Dr. Ding Nai Zhu being the managing director. Thereafter, that is between 1984 and today, Stan has written 30 plays, written and directed two films, wrote a book on creativity. He has taught at Stanford University. He has won prizes in Taipei, Berlin, Tokyo, Singapore. He has performed in Taipei, Shanghai, Beijing, the Bay Area, and elsewhere. He has been reviewed or received reviews in BBC, uh, New York Times, Far Eastern Economic Review, and elsewhere. Most recently, in conjunction with his visit, the media relations of the university has featured two major articles about him. Both were published on January 25th, 2013. I won't repeat the content of that, except to remind you that should you be interested, please refer to the information in there. For the next two weeks, Stan is going to be an artist in residence as an Avanelli resident fellow with the Arts Research Center here at UC Berkeley. With that, please join me in welcoming Stan Lai upon his return to Berkeley, please. So let me explain that Stan and I actually do not know each other very well. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> We've met once or twice. And then, well, he's not a historian, and I'm not much of a drama theater expert. <laughs> so we had a bit of conversation earlier this mm -hmm. afternoon in preparation of this conversation. And I thought I worked out a scheme in my usual way as a historian insisting upon things such as chronology, organization, thrust of an argument, and the points that you eventually might wish to deliver. I've discovered over the course of the conversation in my effort to guide Stan in those directions <laughs> that I ran into 
resistance. <laughs> it wasn't just that. I also found it a somewhat intellectually exhausting exercise running into one of the most complex minds that I have ever encountered. So here it is. Let me just do my pedestrian chore, reading my questions to him <laughs> one by one, and let's see what's going to happen by way of eliciting responses. And let me just say that after he and I have had our conversation, we will we'll see what happens. We'll see, yeah. Right. We'll see. I am taking on the spirit of improvisation. <laughs> Even though the minute that I use the word improvisation, Stan tells me that he doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> so Stan, so we know the outline of your curriculum vita, which tells us where you came from, where you were born, the institutions that you've been to, the places that you have been to. But who are you, <laughs> anyway? That is, in what way are you a product either of your time, your place, or neither? Yeah, I think this is a good place to start. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm honored to be here. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be back at Berkeley, a place that has given me so much. Uh, for, for my career, and uh, I don't know, it's, I think life really goes in cycles, and, and it's been 30 years since, uh, since I got my degree here. So um, that's, a, that's a nice number for, for a cycle. Uh, I, think, I think we're all definitely products of our times. Um, I talk to my students today, and I see their minds are very different from ours. Uh, their aspirations are very different from ours. Um, for many years, I felt that, like in the 90s uh, and in the 2000s, is that what you call them? Yeah, anyway. Um, I found a real lack of, of aspirations, of, of idealistic aspirations. I think our generation was very idealistic. Uh, and it came from the times, which were a very troubled and turbulent times, uh, not necessarily uh, in day-to-day -day life for ourselves, but, but our parents. I think uh, Wenxing and I come from the same generation. Uh, growing up in, in Taipei, uh, our, our parents' generation was the one that um, suffered all of the turbulence from the, uh, the war and the, the civil war in, in China and the, the big split in 1949. Uh, I think, uh, well, my family, my, my father and mother both came from mainland China in 1949 to Taiwan with over a million other people in probably one of the largest uh, mass exoduses in history. Uh, and, and perhaps being the most special uh, of of those mass exoduses uh, being that you came somewhere and you couldn't go back, you know, so there was like one way. And um, like when I did uh, this play a few years ago called Baodao uh, Yitzun, The Village, uh, about this whole generation of people, um, in that play particularly military people, um, when, we went to, when we went to China with the play, and I had no idea that people would be interested in uh, the, the, the Taiwan villages, uh, the, in, the dependent villages for military personnel is what they call them, Jin uh, we, we had an incredibly enthusiastic response to every single performance we had. And before that, people said they had no idea what, what, what this was about because they said, oh, villages, oh, it's the same as in China. You know, we have military dependent <laughs> villages. It's all the same. They call them Jun Dui Da Yuan. They say the same thing. I said, maybe. You know, I don't know anything about the Chinese uh, military dependent villages, but I, I mean, and there should be a similar sense of space and intimacy uh, and the, the sense of going through hardship together. But I'm sure that your military villages do not have something that ours had, which was the sense of wanting to go home and not being able to, 
the sense of never being able to leave and never being able to get back to your homeland. And that is the very special uh, uh, texture of, of the times that I grew up in. Um, and these times also featured uh, martial law uh, in Taiwan. And it was a, quite a, actually a very stifling sort of uh, uh, way. And, and from my curriculum, uh, uh, my CV, you can see that um, I was born in America. So for the first 12 years of my life, I, I, was, I went through the US system, um, which was, for me, wonderful and, and uh, uh, free. And uh, I skipped grades and, and uh, got, I, when I was 11, I was already in eighth grade. And uh, straight A's, everything. Then I went to Taiwan in 1966, immediately flunked. <laughs> so everything is, you know, the, we, in Chinese we say the heavens are all fair, you know. So they, it all evens out somehow. So um, I gave back the year that I skipped. Uh, <laughs> and um, whereas I enjoyed, a, you know, a really uh, free sort of educational style, um, I had my hair totally sh cut and put into a uniform and bring a book bag and bring my lunch in a, in a, in a metal box uh, in Taipei and leave the house before sun, sunrise and get home after sunset. Uh, totally different. It's, it was like from, you know, to totally different experience. And um, I think I am definitely a product of that because uh, unlike all of my, my friends, my classmates, I had a different perspective on all that. Uh, for them, what would have been normal for me was very abnormal. And then when I came back to Berkeley after my college and after having spent, I think, uh, 12 wonderful years in Taiwan, uh, difficult but wonderful, um, and being a part of the whole experience of the martial law, and uh, the, the, that, that whole the stifling of the arts and someone who, would, who as a young person aspiring to be an artist would have no outlet for any of it. Then coming to Berkeley <clears throat> and again experiencing the whole, uh, the whole freedom of it all, I would have a different perspective on that too. So I think if you're talking about a, a product of the times, um, I think these are the things that shape uh, maybe my outlook, and the outlook always shapes the work. So you were there, part of this regime under martial law. Mm -hmm. You had your days been um, among a minority of male students wanting to study humanities and arts. Very small minority. Right. <laughs> and you also had your days doing your compulsory military service. Yes. But then on the other hand, unlike others, precisely because of your family uh, situation, that you had an opportunity to be away. So you were in, and you were also out. That's the story of my life, I guess. I'm in and out. Uh, and uh, when I come to America, I'm, I, I'm totally in. And then, I mean, I, I just do things like from my childhood, I, I enjoy uh, American food, I enjoy American sports, um, soaking it in. And then suddenly I can just sort of jump out and say, isn't that weird? <laughs> what are all these people doing? You know, um, one, one time I got off uh, the plane and I was trying to fight the jet lag and I, I saw there was a San Francisco Giants game uh, available, so I went to the game. It was, then it was at Candlestick Park. Uh, and totally, that's a, just a normal thing for me. I can just go straight in. And then suddenly, I was looking at 40,000 people on a Wednesday afternoon, and I said, how weird is this? You know, what, what, what are these people, where are these people come from? What are, what are they doing in a ballpark on a Wednesday afternoon? Don't they have to be somewhere? You know. <laughs> and, and so it's that, you know, I can suddenly alienate myself from the whole situation and, and see how strange it is, and then sink back into my hot dog. You know, so. But then on the other <laughs> hand, right, Stan, mm -hmm. would you characterize yourself as a wanderer doing your exploration alone? Or were you doing this, at times at least, through the mediation of 
family, friends, and other connections? It's pretty much alone, I think, really, because um, I think every individual has their own unique window on the world. And, and my window has been shaped by, of course, family, definitely. But when, you, when you're doing the journey, you're by yourself. Yeah, and likewise, in, in Taipei, uh, I, can, I love the, the night market food. And I can just, you know, again, go straight in. And then, and then at that mar night market, suddenly just alienate myself and say, how weird is this? You know, why are people eating all this food? <laughs> yeah. So. So by the time when you um, by the time you returned to Taipei in the mid 1980s, mm -hmm. the uh, place was democratizing, right? Martial law was Slightly, not yet yes. lifted, right? Mm -hmm. But um, people were thinking, and it was possible to do some reflection about the repression of the regime up to that point. And then also about the futility or the myth of an eventual military reunification of China yes. under the leadership of the nationalist government. So of course, the 1980s was a very interesting time mm -hmm. in arts, uh, theater, um, academia in Taiwan. And you mentioned that you were very close to um, the director um, Edward Young, you were also very close to Hou Xiaoxian, for instance. Now, they had their take on what they had witnessed, experienced, reflected upon. How would you characterize your take mm -hmm. of your reflection at that moment in comparison I I, with them? I think uh, bringing up uh, Edward Young, who's a dear departed friend, and uh, Hou Xiaoxian, um, the, the, the true maestro. Um, I think you have to understand that in the 80s, uh, what we were doing, we, in a way we were doing it very closely together, even though I was working in theater and they were working in film. Uh, but we'd always support each other and we'd always be at each other's uh, whatever we were doing. So in my rehearsal room, and mind you, this is the, the day without, days without uh, cell phones, uh, so we would be rehearsing and say, oh, you know, uh, Director Ho is here, or oh, Edward is here. Uh, and they would just sit in the corner and watch. And, and I didn't know what they were watching, but it's definitely they're watching a process, a creative process. They're also looking for actors all the time. Um, it's not a coincidence that the three main actors for Secret Love and Peach Blossom Land uh, went, are also the three main actors for Edward Young's The Terrorizers, uh, Kong Bufen's. Uh, same, because he, he was there at our rehearsal all the time. And so after, the, after our theater play was closed, immediately the three of them went to work on his film. Uh, I think, uh, and all of Ho's films were subtitled by myself. If you see any of the older films, I think um, everything up to City of Sadness is uh, by me. Uh, yeah, and uh, they... He has a superstition that if I do the subtitles, then he gets a gets a big award. <laughs> yeah. A mere superstition. <laughs> Empirically, did that turn out to be accurate? That's actually, it was true. You know, it was true. And and I've always offered my services to him, but he's so courteous, and he said, "Oh, you're so busy." Uh, and then just a little off the topic, but not really. When he was uh, doing um, uh, sh the, the puppet master, Shi uh, Meng um I was, you know, we feel we, we feel like um, like it's a, it's the season for Ho is coming. You know, why why don't you call me? You should call me now. I think your film is almost ready. I, you know, I'm sort of trying to get my time ready to do the subtitles for you because City of Sadness, and this is a true story. Uh, he called me, uh, and he said. Um, you know, the film's going to Venice. I said, I heard, congratulations. He said, well, um, we need subtitles. And I said, yeah, OK, um, bring, you know, show me what, what's, you know, he said, OK, he's going to show me a very rough print. I said, OK, when, when do you need them? He said, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> this is a true story. Yeah. So he came up to my house, and he showed, he showed me his rough cut. 
and that's all he had, a rough cut with a, with a dialogue list. And when I was looking at the rough cut, I, it wasn't, the dialogue wasn't even completely onto the, the mouths of the people who were talking. You know? So he had, but he, it was a wonderful experience in my life because you have the director of A City of Sadness explaining everything to me as it unfolds on a little screen. You know? So he's, oh, who's talking here? And why? And I said, wait a minute, I don't get it. He said, oh, you don't, you don't see the person talking. Oh, it's, it's the voiceover. Oh, OK. And then, and then why? And, and then I'm seeing the aesthetic uh, choices he's making, which are incredible. So back to what you were saying, what, what, what I'm saying is what we were doing at that time was not just tackling uh, taboo, like political topics, sensitive issues. Yes, we were doing that. But at the same time, searching for and trying to find, and in many times finding, the right form or the new form or a new way of expressing these new topics that we were working on or that we were tackling um, to the surprise of many people. Yeah. So, so in other words, it was the, the content and the form together we're going through. I wouldn't call it a revolution, but sort of, a, sort of an inventing. There was a time we had to invent everything because uh, we really didn't have anything to go by. But wouldn't you say that um, that is the choice of medium uh, sometimes it's something to do with the impressions, the messages which ended up getting communicated to uh, the audience. So in other words, uh, some of these films, especially by uh, say City of Sadness, um, ends up being received as one of um, one of the the um, artwork that delivered fairly sharp criticism mm -hmm. of the repressiveness of the regime, right? Now, whether I mean, artistically, of course, the film was much more uh, than that. Yes. But nonetheless, it came across as a fairly dark film. That darkness does not seem to be um, something that you choose to emphasize. Mm, in a different way, I think. I think uh, um, my work is, has a lot of, uh, a lot of lightness, if, if there's a word for that. I guess there is, but it's not it meaning, meaning that light, not, you know, not the weight. Uh, I, think, uh, I think there's a lot of light in my work, and I like it that way. But sometimes the light accents the darkness, and that's the, the strategy is, you know, for instance, if back to the, the village, that play, um, traditionally literature and films about villages are very dark. And to me, I'm, when I started tackling this uh, creative challenge, I thought, you know, if the whole, the whole um, atmosphere, the whole, if you had a soundtrack uh, for the, the background soundtrack for a, uh, a village piece, it would be dark, dark, dark. OK, so if you're going to write something dark and put it on a background of dark, I'm sorry, that doesn't do it for me. So if, if, if it's very dark and then we're going to try to paint something light on it, I think that's, that makes sense to me. And that's why people see the play and, they, and, they're, and they're amazed at their own emotions because they start by, by weeping, and then they start laughing, and then, the, and then it keeps on going back and forth throughout the three hours of the, of the show. So I think this is something, if I call it a strategy, it's, it's, too, uh, it's too much uh, like I'm planning it. You know, I think it just comes naturally from, from my own uh, character, that this is the way that I like to do it, and this is the way that I find people very responsive to this sort well, of Well, occasionally, you know. mm -hmm. right? people do die in your place. Oh, yes. <laughs> Quite often, actually. Yeah. They mm -hmm. do die in your place. But then on the other hand, it's, um, death is not necessarily um, a termination or a resolution. Death is not necessarily dark, either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Care uh, to elaborate on that, please? <laughs> well, um, Let's say in, in the village, uh, one of the main characters passes away. It's, it's very sad. But you see him again, because he, 
in the end, he, he reads he, his ghost, or maybe his, uh, the, the, the imagination of him from his son, or the memory of him from his son, reads a letter at the end, which sort of summarizes the whole, the whole show. Currently, I'm working on a play of mine called A Dream Like a Dream, which is, a, which is an eight-hour work uh, that we did in Taipei and, and, uh, and Hong Kong before. But now I'm rehearsing it in Beijing uh, for, for performances in April, starting in April. Um, and this play is very much about death. Uh, and we, and the, probably the climactic scene, which comes around seven hours into the show, is, uh, is three uh, simultaneous deaths uh, on stage of the main characters. And um, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's, it's a, whole, it's a different animal. You know, we're, when we're talking about light and dark, um, it's sort of, to me, um, theater is something that uh, more and more I feel that if we can make theater, that lets the audience come into the theater and face reality in the world. I think this is what we should be doing. And of course, more and more theater and more and more it goes toward the entertainment side. And, and Hollywood is perhaps uh, the antithesis of that. They want you to come into the theater and then forget about reality. Uh, and I think forgetting about reality is the pure entertainment uh, aspect. But facing reality, then, then you come back to the deeper meanings of, of theater and, and its connections to, to rituals, I think, of which we have lost you know, as, as a communal entity. We, we, we don't have our communal rituals anymore. So that's why a, a play like A Dream Like a Dream becomes, uh, uh, people become very interested in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, you are aware of it, namely the BBC, New York Times, other journals call you the most influential playwright today in the Chinese-speaking world. <coughs> and then the way that, that uh, you stage things, that is for your audience, your play, obviously, the performance, obviously, has been extremely effective vis-a-vis -vis the uh, people in the audience, uh, creating a sense of ritual, uh, delivering a sense of oblivion for the moment, and so forth. But then at the same time, it's very difficult, isn't it, for others to emulate the way you do things. In other words, when it comes to your fellow professionals, in what way do you see your work as being influential. Do you want to play with this notion <laughs> of the enigma of influence? That's a good point, because um, I don't think you see many uh, new works that that look like mine. You know, I, I, I don't know how to say it. I think um, in China, um, which is so good at uh, duplicating everything, you know, <laughs> uh, including all of my uh, uh, DVDs and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just last week in Beijing, someone showed me a 40-some DVD set of, of our works uh, available online for you know, a ridiculous price. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and one time I was uh, given a, a beautiful silk box of, uh, of my plays. Uh, 17 DVDs of, of my works, and with my photo and signature on it, actually. <laughs> uh, and I, and I talked, my manager was there, I said, when did we do this one? And he scratched his head, you know, and, and the person who gave it to me said, um, uh, you, you, Mr. Lai, uh, don't, don't, please don't be sad at this. Uh, uh, if one day your company decides to do release the, the authorized version, you just have to copy theirs, you know. <laughs> because they did such a good job, you know. Yeah. But, uh, and there have been uh, lots of plays that copy the names of, of my works, or sort of, sort of copy the names so that they look like something like mine. And uh, at times when I have uh, uh, endorsed a work, um, then 
I've seen posters saying it's my work. Yeah, so that happens too. But that's not at all what you're talking about. What you are talking about is, uh, in an artistic way, um, how have my works um, influenced the next generation of playwrights? And I'm at a loss, because I think this is something, uh, for me, well, f for one thing, it's none of my business. I mean, how you are influenced by me, is none of, it's not for me to control. And, and I can't say that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a follower of any of that, because it, you know, if it happens, it happens. But, but I, think, um, I think the real problem is we have not yet seen the next generation of playwrights. We have not seen um, remarkable works coming out of China when I thought we would. And once I was in Shanghai, a few years ago, uh, I was lecturing at the Shanghai Drama Academy, or Theater Academy, and I challenged the graduate students in the room with me. I said, uh, how come I don't see the next generation of great playwrights? Where are they? And directors, you know, I thought that after, you know, after everything, after the Cultural Revolution, after this whole opening up of, of uh, things, loosening up of uh, uh, all the restrictions and everything, I was waiting for you guys, so where are you? And there was a brief silence, and then this, uh, this woman in the back uh, stood up and very loudly said, I, because my question was, where are you? And, and she said, we're waiting for the Communist Party to die. <laughs> and I said, wow, that's a pretty strong statement for this room, you know, which was you know, in the, uh, but now, now, this was maybe five years ago. And I think this line is a cop-out. It's a total cop-out. Because this is, you know, you don't need the Communist Party to die. You have, you have plenty of space to, to do pretty much what you want now in China. Um, there are definite taboos, and, and they call them the, the, the red territories that you don't, you're not going to want to traverse. Uh, of course, you, you're not. I mean, if you want to write a play about, you know, Tiananmen Square, forget it, you know? I mean, please, you know, you, that, that'll just show how foolish you are if you, if you intend to have it produced in China, forget it. If you want to write a play about Tibet, forget it, you know? It's just not gonna happen in the next, in the foreseeable future. If you want to write a play about the Falun Gong, you know, the, forget it. It's, how, how could you want to try to do that, you know? And, Okay, I've just said about the three major taboos. Uh, aside from those three, I think basically you can write about most, most things. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then, Stan, in some ways, what you were saying here is that, um, I mean, we were talking about influence, right? That is, why are there not more people who come forward and seeing themselves as being under your influence or under your inspiration. Your response to me just now is a way of saying that the conditions of creative expression do exist, that is, in the greater China world today. Yes. But then what you are not telling me, or not yet, is to offer an analysis, perhaps, of the way that you work that is, you bring all the bits and pieces together as you create a play, making it a success or making it a piece of influence, right? So if you're going to do a self-analysis mm -hmm. of how you do things, mm -hmm. what, how would that sound like? Okay, and then I, I see where in, you're going. Yeah. You see mm -hmm. where I'm going, I right? And then also going. keep in mind, mm -hmm. I, I'm reminded ages ago, my reading of Lionel Sperling, for instance. And then you were, of course, uh, the founding dean of a college of um, theater. Now, Lionel Sperling would say that there are certain things which are teachable, but then there are also other things that in the processes of transmission are not necessarily teachable. So. Please offer, first of okay. all, a response. This is a two-part PhD oral exam type of question. <laughs> and it's complicated. It's very complicated. Please. Because I'm today, just at this moment, I'm being brought face-to-face -face with, with this 
uh, thought that um, actually my work is difficult to do. I'm uh, even I mean by any standards, it's like not easy stuff to put out. Why? Because when I started working uh, in eighty in eighty three eighty four straight from Berkeley, we did not have a uh, tradition of modern theater in Taiwan. We did not. When I was an undergraduate in Taiwan, there was nowhere we could go to see modern theater. Very little, very, very, very little. Uh, there was maybe one group that performed once a year. And then there was Cloudgate that was just starting. Uh, that was probably the only stuff we could see. So it was pretty crazy for someone like me to want to learn theater because how could I know what theater was about? I couldn't. There was no way. Um, so when I after Berkeley, which, which not only gave me a solid foundation academically, scholastically, but also embedded me with the spirit of Berkeley, which is, which is you may know a lot, but you don't, um, every, every situation is, is new and every situation is unique. So you don't expect to, to use what you know on that new situation. So here I was, newly minted PhD, going back to Taiwan, where, which was basically a, a real desert culturally. There was just nothing. Uh, there was, there was no, not even a theater that was, that was like the theaters you have here with, a, with, with the usable machinery and, and the fly, fly system and everything like that. This is the stuff I was trained on. You know. but, we didn't even have a proper theater. There were no playwrights, no directors. There were no theater companies. So everything that I learned was not usable there. So what do you do? No problem. You try to, you try to figure out what to do. Because I, I, I really felt that despite the fact that we, there was nothing there, there was something there. There was something very valuable. And that is the human potential of all the people who are interested and willing to work with me on, in theater. And this was quite amazing, uh, all of the people that, um, the, the creative energy from, from these people. And so we started just, I decided to just throw away all of my training and, and work with these actors or with my students and see what they wanted to express inside themselves. And so I would be like, sort of like a chef. And the actors would be bringing me all these uh, what do you call materials to, to cook, and I would be the one cooking them in the end. So that's where the improvisation comes from. This whole, this is what I learned at Berkeley too. A whole method of of making new plays through improvisational rehearsals, and this is the way I've been working for many for many many years. So that's why I'm saying, it's not easy. There's it's like the the entry level is, is very high. Um, for all these years, I've, t I've tried to teach my method of making, uh, uh, devising theater through collaborative work with uh, actors through an improvisational uh, process. And I find it, now I've found it, it's, it's, not, it's almost impossible to teach. You know, you have to really just work with me. And you might know some of the fund fundamentals. Just last week in Beijing, I was rewriting one act of uh, A Dream Like a Dream, which runs for almost an hour. And, uh, and I re resorted to this um, technique. And all the actors were so excited because they, they wanted to take part. They'd heard about it, and they wanted to take part. But I don't do it the way I used to do it. The way I used to do it was a very, very sort of democratic uh, system where, where we could spend months and months just working on one one topic, and then uh, we would have all the ideas from all of the cast. Nowadays, we just don't have time to work that way. That's, that's one thing. And so I'm the one who's improv Im Im improvising more than any of the actors. So in one hour in Beijing, I worked three scenes. And uh, I have my assistant who is, who is taking down all the, all the notes of everything that is being said. And bang, it was over. And they said, what, what happened? We done? I said, yeah, we're done. We finished. We're, we have three scenes. And they didn't quite understand what was going on. But maybe it's because I've been doing it so long that I can do it in this way. So it's not just a question of how I do it. 
I think it's a, it's a question of the difficulty of it is in the topics itself. When I was put into this environment in Taiwan in 1983-84 and deciding that we want to have our own theater, we don't want to just, I mean, we could have gone the route of just translating plays and, and, and producing them and directing them, doing Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov, uh, you name it. Um, could have done that. But I decided that that was not the way to do it, um, that we should do our own. And so this to, I think, to a young playwright today, this is rather intimidating, you know, to, to um, really de dig deep into yourself and say, what do you care about? What do you want to write about? What do you see? Uh, to me, I'm seeing so many things. Uh, in, in Taiwan, in China, uh, there's so much to write about. But I don't know. I guess they, they're not able to take the first step, which takes courage, which is I want to write about what I care about. And instead, they, they try to write about what they think the audience wants to care about. And to me, that's a trap, you know, because you're trying to anticipate what an audience wants to see. And you just get caught in a whole, I think, in a whole bad cycle. Um, and if, if your whole uh, motivation is, is, is commercial, you know, I, I just say it very, very simply, if, you're, if your motivation is to, you want to make money, how, how are you going to write a good play? You know, it's just these two things, they just don't fit together in, in a very, very elementary way. So I think, you know, I think there are two things to creativity. One is posing the question and posing the challenge to yourself. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is finding a solution to that challenge. And to me, this is the creative process. So the, when you first pose, what are the questions you're posing to yourself? You can, you can have the very simple and questions that don't have any impact on anybody. You know, like, what am I going to have for lunch? You know, or you know, something like that. Or, or, or you want to write a play about you know, um, a certain food in the night market in, in, in Taipei. You know, okay, that's, that's okay, sure, why not? But <clears throat> where is the impact and where, where, where is, where is the, the, the blood and the sweat of all of that? The deeper you, you want to dig and the deeper you want to care about people, about society, about politics, uh, about suffering, uh, then you pose bigger, bigger topics and bigger questions that take more and more difficult techniques to solve. So, so this is basically, I'm just saying, what any creative person goes through. And to the young people today, it means taking a dive into this, the waters of, of you don't know. You don't know where it's going to go. But I think, I think they lack the courage. And, and this is something I'm challenging. Uh, the younger playwrights today to, to, to tell me I'm wrong, but I think you lack the courage of, uh, like the woman who said she wanted, was waiting for the Communist Party to die. I think that's a cop out, you know, really. I think you're, you're not being genuine to your, your true feelings and, and you're not being genuine to admit that you don't care enough about the people around you and, and the world you live in. Otherwise, there's so much you can do and so much you can write about. So it's a combination, right? That is, there is a purposefulness on your part, mm -hmm. digging deep into yourself and directing. And then at the same time, obviously, you are not interested in writing fiction or autobiography. So you do work deeply with the people, with the set, with the scene, with the stage, everything. So it's a combination about uh, directing with purposefulness and then also letting go, visualizing what's there, engaging with things, and bringing everything together. You mentioned that the balance between the two, when you mm -hmm. were younger mm -hmm. or these days, 
seem to have shifted somewhat. Yes, I think you put it quite uh, quite well, I can understand what you're saying. I don't, I don't know if anyone else could because it's complicated. Because the way I work is like, um, uh, if you see me working, like last week in Beijing, if you saw me working, you probably still couldn't figure out what I was doing. But basically, I'm a playwright who functions best when my actors are there. Okay, so my actors, meaning my characters are there. So I'm writing the play while my characters are there. You know, that's a great luxury. It's like, it's an incredible luxury. It's, it's, not, it's different from sitting in a room and just writing yourself, facing a computer. Um, I think um, uh, in Shakespeare's days, I really doubt if he wrote his plays just sitting there writing. You know, I really, having studied Shakespeare here at Berkeley, I really think he worked with his actors. He had to, because there was one, one time in a, in a seminar of ours People were, one of the students was doing a paper on the, 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 the shift in um, Shakespeare's philosophy when it uh, came to the handling of his uh, clowns, you know, from the earlier stage to the later stage, how his philosophy deepened when, he, when, the, when the clowns were talking. Uh, and to me, I said, wait a minute, didn't he change actors? Yeah, so, so his, his major uh, clown, his major comic actor changed during his career. And the original one was, a, was an incredible um, juggler, very physical actor. So, um, and then the, the later one was a more moody and more pensive sort of clown. And so that's why he changed, you know, to me. I mean, it's so simple. You change, a main, you change your major actor then everything changes, you know. So to me, uh, it's a complicated process. There's a purposefulness there in that we are trying to achieve a goal. But this is, this is the key point here, is that when you're working, you have to throw it away. You have to throw away the purposefulness and let go of what you're trying to do to get to where you want to be. Uh, I think I'm sounding very 60s, huh? <laughs> but that, I'm, that's, to me, that's how it is. If, when, I'm, when I'm working, when I'm writing a work with my actors there, I will set them up. I will say, you're here, please sit there. Wait a minute, let me think about it. Okay, you sit there. And then you're who, you're who. And then this is the situation. Uh, and okay, let's start it. And, and if you're watching, you're saying, start what? You know, because there's no script. You know, and then the actors will start performing without a script. And, and in the old days, that's what we would do. And nowadays, it's more me doing it. You know, I, I would just be saying, can you please sit here? OK, get her some coffee. You know, and then, and, and, OK, drink the coffee. And then, and then the lines would be coming from me. You know, and then my assistant would be taking all the lines down. And then we're done. Let's go home. You know, so, it, it becomes sort of a mystery for all of the actors involved. It's like they sort of more and more become like, like models for a painter. You know, when, when, you're, when a painter is painting, obviously if the model is there, they paint better, I think. You know, they can obviously paint without the models, but I think when the models are there, the actors are there, and they're much more than models. They, they, they really um, offer so much more. So I think it's, the process itself is not, uh, Im imi imitatable, Im imi I'm sorry, my English, uh, Im imitable, right? It cannot imitable. be mechanically yeah. reproduced. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank or you. or Thank you. institutionally represented. Yeah. That is, cannot be Xeroxed. <laughs> it can, cannot be either organizationally, institutionally, mechanically, or commercially yes. reproduced. Yeah. Talking about copyright, huh? <laughs> right. But um, it's not just the process, which is very specialized. I think it's the challenge itself. I think that is something that uh, if, if people want to, to uh, uh, get the influence from, from my works, our works, I think they should really see that we set very high standards for, for ourselves, in, particularly in what we what we want to write about, you know, what we want to perf perform on the stage, uh, what we want to offer to our audience. 
And I, yeah, so that's Dave, the key thing. You write about uh, displacement, right? You write about the absurdity or the impediments or uh, the desperation of going home. That is the whole notion of homeland and return. Um, it's been highly problematic in your work. So in a way, and then if we reconnect um, with uh, how we begin this conversation, you are writing the lost memories of your father's generation. Are you writing history? Wow. <laughs> you know, when I work, I don't think about that much. You know, I don't think about displacement or whatever. I mean, that, that, that's really, these are terms that, that, you know, scholars should be using. But I think if, if we, the, the directors and playwrights, start using them, we get in trouble too. We get into, we fall into a bad cycle also uh, as, we, as we try to be uh, significant or, or whatever, or whatever you call it. Um, but um, I think history is, is, a, is a weird thing. I've, I've always um, been a bit troubled by history because I don't believe there can be a totally um, objective history of anything, you know because somebody's got to write it. And that somebody has to have some viewpoint, you know. Uh, even if that viewpoint is total objectivity, that total objectivity certainly has subjectivity in it. So how can we really understand? I had a conversation with a, a former classmate of mine yesterday. It was wonderful. We're talking about Stanislavski and how all of Stanislavski's works were not really Stanislavski. But a Stalin version of Stanislavski, you know, and so um, where are the real works? The, re the real works actually, um, there is an incredible uh, scribbled manuscript of Stanislavski here at the Bancroft Library in Berkeley. Uh, yeah, and, and it's the only copy existing in the world. So, um, what is the Stanislavski system? I mean, what is history? What is uh, what? It, what happened yesterday? Um, you know, uh, in, in the United States, you, you turn on Fox News, you get one version, right? You turn on another station, you get another version. And in Taiwan, even more so, much, much more so. The uh, news is so biased. To me, the news should be what we're talking about, a journal of, of our times, of history. And you, t you take out the major newspapers in Taiwan, and you, you need about five or six, and you piece together the stories and you figure out, oh, what, probably what happened yesterday. Yeah, probably. Uh, so I'm very cynical when it comes to history. Forgive me about that. And you must educate me on that. You, really, you must educate me on that. But, but uh, people have said that um, my plays are, are writing history of our times. And I think that's a bit unfair. You know, I, don't think, I don't think a playwright has to ha should have the responsibility of, uh, of, of, of chrono, uh, is, there a, is there a verb for chronology? Chrono chronicling, thank you. I was thinking chronalizing, no, there's no word. Chronicling the times. Um, and I don't think that's our job. But once in a while, uh, we get to do it. Um, and people have said if 50 years or 100 years later, if people want to know what happened in Taiwan in the late 20th century, they might get a better idea from one of Performance Workshop's plays uh, than from reading the newspaper. And I find that might be true, uh, because I think what we chronicle are not events, and, and we, we can't be true to them. Uh, because the, real, the way things unfold in real time is not necessarily theatrical or dramatic, and we would, and we would have to rearrange everything. But, I think what we chronicle in terms of, of human beings and the human heart, I think this is something special that, that journalists do not do or cannot do or not, not supposed to do. But that's what we're supposed to do. And I think there definitely is a place where the two can, can merge somewhere. So you do not quite see there be a tyranny of a monolithic construction, either of time or of space. Right? You, do, you are not entrapped 
as some of your characters seem to be, <laughs> in a time, a place. On the other hand, you are not completely outside of time and place. No, it's a, it's it's a mix that we have to have. I think the times serve as uh, the palette for 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 our work. The canvas, actually, more that to be more specific, the canvas is is the times. But what we put on that canvas, we hope transcends the times, and that's the whole idea of of art, I guess. I think in any time. Great. So, Stan, my final question: For whom are you performing? For whom I am I? That's a good question. I think we're always torn between the whole concept of, of egoistic or altruistic, uh, the two extremes. I think as an artist, uh, you have to have a big ego to be an artist. But once you're really doing things, that ego has to grow smaller and smaller. And you have to understand that you are serving uh, a greater humanity, whether that humanity be 100 people in a theater or, or millions of people watching a film, um, you, you, are, you are part of what's happening now and you should be serving. Uh, this is ide idealistically, uh, who am I writing for? Um, I find it's less and less for myself. And, and when I find that, I feel, I feel good. If I find that I'm writing more and more for myself, um, and I don't tend to do that because um, if you try to find me in my place, you, you know, good luck. You know, I'm not, I'm not always there. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really hope, like for instance, the village. I really felt, and I told my actors over and over. I said, this isn't for us. You know, this is really for the generation that we are portraying, and when the audience gives a standing ovation, which they usually do. I told my actors, I said, um, they're, they're, they're not applauding at you. They are, but they're not. They're really applauding at the characters that you're portraying. And they're giving the whole era a standing ovation. Not, it's, it's not us. You know, I, we, don't want, we don't want to, of course, it, it feels good that, that they do that. But we don't get wrapped up in that. We're really here to provide a service. And people tell us, if we didn't do that play, then the memory of the villages would by now already have been gone because the physical buildings have all been demolished. But uh, you know, I think this is just a goal of mine and I'm very far from it. So don't think that I'm, uh, I've, I've gotten there yet. So I take it that you're happy about choosing or having chosen theater as your <laughs> primary medium of self-expression. Happy? I don't know. Are it's, you happy? Uh, you know, because our medium is such a frail medium. It's so frail. Um, the other night in uh, in um, in Hefei, uh, in Anhui, we're performing Peach Blossom Land, and uh, and this just this thing, this uh, coaster, fell from the from the fly system. It could have killed someone, but didn't. Um, and something like that reminds you of the fragility of, of the theater and that we, I have never been in a situation where I've gotten everything right and, and, and then performed. It's always compromise, always, always compromise. Um, it's, it's, if, you're, if you're a perfectionist, which I am, you're always tortured because you can never get it right. And, and in Asia where I work, we only get like four days to set up a show. Uh, a new show, a brand new show that has never been teched before. We have three or four days to do it. Um, and that's crazy. I think anyone here in the United States would, would, not, would refuse to do it. You know? but, but if you refuse to do it, then you don't get your work shown. So you have to strike a compromise somewhere. And that's what I've been doing all my life. So you ask me if I'm happy. Yeah, sure I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you on all. that note, Thank you very much. My pleasure. Stan Lai, and welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to take a couple of questions from the Certainly. audience? We have a little bit of time for questions from the floor. OK, wait. She was uh, first, I think. Which one? Peyton? Yeah. Right, please. Thank you so much. Welcome back to Berkeley. I, I guess I should also identify myself that I'm a 
student of Professor Ye's in Chinese history, so the preview of the oral exam was very, oh, very, very enlightening. Eye opening. Yes. Very eye opening. Um, I have a two part question. Okay. That one has to do with the question of audience, and the second, which is related, has to do with the question of where the artist bases him or herself. And the author Amitav Ghosh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know him. Um, not well, not well. Uh, oh, um, he's an Indian right. author. Yes anthropology PhD, but he writes about sort of uh, the afterlife of empire, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, sea of Poppies was his most recent book. And he said that there's a danger when artists, and he might have been talking specifically about authors, write only from experience yes. because it limits imagination. And so that, that has a little bit to do with where the author himself is. And the second artist I was thinking of that relates to you is Orhan Pamuk, who mentioned after he won the Nobel that he didn't want to be read as someone introducing Turkey to the world, but rather as someone who had something to say about universal themes such as love yes. and loss. And the last artist I, I sort of situated you with is Ang Lee, who is very different from Ho Xiaoxian and yes. um, Edward Yang in that he's based himself in the United States and his work has appealed to, I guess you would say, Western art audiences with, say, Sense and Sensibility, but he does um, do work like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and uh, Lost Caution. So my question is, in terms of audience, you said you don't write for yourself, but it seems natural that your audience is the Chinese-speaking world. And how do you feel about that, first? And secondly, um, does the fact that you live in Taiwan and that you work in, say, Beijing or Shanghai, you know, does that, it sort of uh, puts you in a particular space and place? And how does that affect the content of your work? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think the two questions are related. Um, you know, we, w there's so much we cannot control, you know, as, as a playwright and director. You, you can't control, uh, you can't surely say when a play of yours is going to be produced for who. You just have to go with it, you know. And, and uh, my upbringing, I, I'm bilingual and bicultural. You know, I could have, I, I could, I did uh, Secret Love and Peach Blossom Land at Stanford in 2007 in English, in my own translation. And it worked perfectly, you know. And people were saying, why, is, why don't we see this uh, all over the place? And I said, that's, I don't know, you know. That's uh, up, up for American companies to uh, figure out. And, and my friends, uh, my former classmates, one Tony Tacconi, who's at Berkeley Rep, you know, I asked him once, I said, would you be interested in a play like this? He, and his, his answer was, how many, how many in the cast? And I said, 11. And he said, sorry. You know, yeah, it's just the economic reality. He just told me, he said, sorry, we don't do anything over six. You know, yeah, it's, and I said, what happened to America? You know, like, yeah, <laughs> really, it's sad. It's very sad. Um, so all my life, I've, most of my life, I've been working in Chinese uh, for a Chinese audience. Um, and I, I think what you mentioned is particularly what Wenxing was say, saying about um, about time and, and space and space, and we are we are prisoners of our own time and space, but we're also working outside of it. And I think that's what what uh, uh, you you're saying is that certainly we're trying to speak to all of humanity. Uh, recently. Uh, very recently, I've been working in English again, something that uh, hasn't been seen yet, but may be seen, we'll see. Uh, and you may be surprised, it's, it's going to be a, a musical uh, about Bruce Lee for Broadway. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and, um, and I've, I've had a lot of fun writing it in English, and uh, if everything works out, I'll be directing it. And, uh, but. I've been warned that um, at any, you know, my, my producers are some of the best on Broadway, like Lion King producer and everything, and they say, 
be warned, you know. At any moment, there are 50 shows trying to get on Broadway. And of those 50, five will make it. And of those five, one will succeed. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, to me, I don't care. Uh, I just uh, do my best when whatever project comes to me. Um, I've still got a few in my mind that I want to do just independently without, you know, any nudging from anybody. But um, basically, you just try to, you, you have to have a blind faith as a, as a playwright that what you care about is what other people care about. You know, because if, if what I care about, other people don't care about, you know, either I'm a prophet, a lonely prophet, or there's something wrong with me, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, because my mind is working in a strange way, you know. <laughs> Thank you, please. This is a film question. I was wondering, you, mm -hmm. you mentioned one important director. Yes. Uh, of Puppet, Puppet Master yes, film. Yes, Mr. Ho, yes. And I was wondering if you could mention maybe a few film directors and a few films, whether in Chinese language or other languages, that have been particularly important uh, and inspiring to you. OK. Yeah. Well, the two, that I, the two directors, Mr. Ho, Ho Xiaoxian, and the, the other, um, Edward Yang, Y-A-N-G, um, if you're not familiar with their work, I think any of their work would be totally captivating. Uh, Mr. Ho, he, he developed a very special way of telling stories through long, long, long shots uh, because he had no, he had no uh, professional actors to work with. He was working with amateurs. And uh, when he did close-ups, he didn't like what he saw. So he, he put the camera very far away and, and let them sort of move in and out of the frame. And that became very iconic. And, and everyone you know, wanted to shoot like him. But he's a product of that time, where, where he didn't have the resources. And uh, he did such beautiful work. Um, Edward Young uh, is, a, is a different kind of, uh, uh, I think, if you can find a film called A Brighter Summer Day. It is, or, the, or maybe his last film called uh, e -E -E -Y -I -Y -I, which means one, one in, in uh, yeah. Yes. It's, that's available, and that, that year, that film won the National Film Critics Best Film of the Year, uh, for, you know, period. Um, and it's a beautiful work, uh, and I, I miss Edward very, very much. He's, he, was a, he was really a genius, and, and so is Ho. Uh, I think any work of his, A City of Sadness, if you can find, um, and you'll see my subtitles on it, of course. Yeah. <laughs> And even earlier work, um, uh, some, I don't even know if these works are available uh, in America, but like A Summer at Grandpa's was one of my favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and even my wife was in it for, you, you can see her uh, lying on a hospital bed. You know, it's like every, they, all of our resources were pulled together. Um, one of the lamps in my homes has been in three of Edward Young's films. And <laughs> yeah, and my daughter is in A Brighter Summer Day, you know, so, um, yeah, he said, no. I said, how many days shooting? Oh, a few days, and it took a few months, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. So they say never lend anything to people who are making films, you know, but that's what I did for many years. <laughs> yeah, I think... If you're not familiar, the, the Taiwanese films of the 80s and, and, and early 90s are amazing works of art. Yeah, amazing. Ang Lee was a bit part of that, and then he left, you know. But uh, uh, Ang is also very well respected, and, uh, you know. I, but I think more representative of, the, of what we are trying to create an independent sort of uh, expression for Taiwan and for our own experience of, of, of what we were doing, you know, yeah. I think, I think Ho and Yang are the, definitely, they are the, they are the ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Please. Oh, by the way, you can also see my film, The Peach Blossom Land. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. It's uh, also from that era, yeah. Yes. That would be day after tomorrow. Right, right. Mm -hmm. at the PFA. Not knowing any of your work, I, I would like you to, uh, if you'd be willing, to tell a little bit more about this process you described mm. where you said you look at the actors and you tell them to go here. Do you, 
do you get your inspiration for their dialogue and what they say from just how they look? Yeah, or basically, yeah. do you have them say, I mean, do you imagine the story as just by in, the, so it's all on appearances of the, of the sort of the physical well, appearance? Well, in the old days, like 30 years ago when I was just starting, um, it would be a very tedious uh, process of setting up a scene and figuring out who was who, and then they just start acting and I would be taking notes and maybe in five minutes something interesting would happen. Then, after we got uh, many productions going, and what happened to me basically was uh, I worked with students for three productions, and then I got my own uh, theater, professional theater group together in 1985. And the first production, which we didn't think what was not intended at all for a larger audience, became such a big hit that, I mean, it was totally crazy. Well, that, let me just give you an example from that play, which was called, uh, uh, roughly, that evening we performed Crosstalk, which is a, uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, stand-up comedy for two people that was, uh, um, in the Qing Dynasty, was, was one incredible and sort of died out. And so we made a play about the death of, of that kind of comedy. Yeah, and so I would be with the two actors and we would say, okay, let's, I would say, let's do something from 1962, okay, because the, 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 the whole structure which I set up was we go back in time to different periods, and the last period would be the 1890s in the Qing Dynasty, and we would recreate a, a crosstalk version, something like who's on first, okay, in different periods, and people would, they would look at them, listen to them, and say, yeah, I thought that's authentic. But then there would be things he would say, oh no, it's modern. You know, so so our own, the, the task that we set out for ourselves was extremely difficult. But then how we would approach it was, okay, 1962. All right, let's start with what? Uh, and then one of the actors said, how about street sounds? I said, great. So hawkers, sounds of hawkers of food, go. And then they, the two of them would start thinking about their childhood, you know, and, and the three of us together would be improvising on sounds that we heard. And some totally ridiculous came back to mind, you know, like there was one, one actor, uh, he, he said uh, uh, in Chinese, Jing ya ying ya na chulai mai. It means gold tooth, silver tooth, take them out, bring them out to sell. And my God, that is, so representative of a certain, I mean, you don't hear that. You would not possibly hear that unless it was a totally destitute time that people would come out and then on the street get their teeth knocked out by this you know, street person and then they take, take out the, the gold and give you money for it. You know? So then we would start assembling these together into something like who's on first. You know? And then day by day by day by day, the whole thing, in seven months we did this two, two and a half hour play which turned out to be extremely successful. Uh, but that's kind of the way we did it. And, and today, we don't ha I don't have the time, and the actors don't have the time for, for seven months. I love it. You know, I would love to do th this for the rest of my life. Just, I would just love to do a play that has no time limit on it. Because all the work I do now, it's like I'm not even, I haven't even written the play, and the tickets are already sold. You know. <laughs> No, that sounds crazy, but that's, that's the way it is. And, and that's how I have to honor my commitment to the audience. So um, I, would, I will set up and then maybe it's because I've been doing it really a long time. I, I, I look at myself as a uh, um, craftsman more than an artist. I think artist is a very overused word. But my craft is is making plays and making scenes. Scenes are the total building block of a, of a play. And so if I set up a scene um, in Beijing, what I was doing was setting up a scene from 1930s Paris and a Chinese woman in Paris in 1932 uh, among, in Montparnasse amongst all these artists. Uh, I wrote this in 2000 
And uh, recently I saw Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, and I said, well, you stole that from me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but, but I, they did, Woody Allen's work, of course, amazing, and I, inspired me to go and rewrite everything that I did. So I would be saying, you're, you're who, you're who, you're who, okay, let's start, and then stop. I would just say stop, and I would just sort of with them in front of me. It's my craft, you know, is to feel what the moment was and feel what it's all about. And then I would start directing traffic. Okay, you, you guys come in, you do this, you know, you lie on the ground, you know, you're drunk, you know. And, and, then, and then I would tell him when to wake up and everything. It's, it's basically just writing the play while they're there. And, and it's, uh, to me, it's a, it's a great luxury. Yeah. We have time for actually just one final question. And I believe this gentleman had his hand up first. Your craft is so difficult to mature to your present st state. The reason in the mainland China you don't have a new playwright, is it because of their basic technique and the knowledge was inadequate? Or is that uh, is too far a jump, f leap forward to your level of performance? Well, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer it well. Uh, I think it would be arrogant to say that it's too big a leap, uh, but it may be. You know, I'm, I'm coming around slowly to that realization that it is a big leap because um, when, when people first started seeing my work in China, uh, the first time was 1998, a play of mine called Red Sky. It's about uh, an old person's home in Taiwan. And in, and in Taiwan, uh, or in America when we perform this, it's a very humorous play and people laugh basically from the beginning. And of course, um, it, in the end, it's, it's, it's a very, very serious work. But in China, nobody laughed, you know, because they couldn't figure out what was going on, you know, because of the way that I'm, the way that I present everything. But it, it wasn't, like my work is not, um, what's the word? Uh, it's, it's, to it's user friendly, you know, it's not like I'm trying to do, say something that you're never going to understand or use some exp expression that you will never understand. It's totally accessible. It's just that people wouldn't dare laugh because we want to laugh, but is that what he meant? You know, did he want me to laugh? You know, and, and the whole experience of, of Chinese uh, playwriting and, and directing, I find it quite one-dimensional. You know, even though there are different styles of, of working in China and there are great artists in China, the work tends to be uh, one-dimensional, acting styles and everything. And so when they see work, work of mine, which is multi-dimensional because all, every single one is tailored to its particular task. You see, I don't have one style. My one style is the style is because the way I write plays, they're all different. So, you know, people are going, are, am I supposed to laugh? And then when they see it 20, 30 times, then they know they can start laughing. And, <laughs> and then in the end, it's, it's, all, it's just the same as performing in Taipei. So it takes time. It's, it takes time for the audience. It takes time for the writers. Um, I, think, I think one big thing about China uh, is that the artists are trained to say something, you know, they always have to say something in their work. When The Village was performed in Beijing, uh, there were quite a few professionals who came backstage and talked to me, and they said, how did you do that? I said, do what? And they said, how did you take yourself out of it? And I say, oh, this is the key, you see, because to me, it's the natural thing to do is that I shouldn't be in there. You see, but for them, the natural thing to do is they, their voice must be heard through a character or through something. You know, they have to make a statement. And to me, I'm trying not to make a statement. I'm trying to let the stories, the scenes tell a story and the, the stories told will make a statement. I don't have to make that statement. Uh, but I think this is the way that un, under the <coughs> communist uh, sort of aesthetics that this is, this is what has happened. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just this is the way it is. And, and this is a whole sort of school that um, they are seeing in my work that I can dismantle this kind of school. But they don't quite know how to do it, I think. That's, that's uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. But, yeah. So on that note,
Thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. And let me just remind everyone, um, Stan is our artist in residence. He will be presenting in several programs in the next 10 days. And I look forward to seeing all of you again on various occasions.